Well, here we are. This is my final message. At least I, pl I plan for it to be my final message in this series of messages from 1 Timothy. I, I may do a series, continue in 2 Timothy, but there'll probably be a break before I do that. I haven't decided for sure. Um, I'm not surprised that it came out to 31 messages because like Paul's other epistles, uh, 1 Timothy, which has six chapters, is just really dense with truth. It's like, it just feels like every verse uh, is bringing up really important theological truths. Uh, it's not literally every single verse uh, brings up a, a, a different big theological truth, but it almost feels like that. And, um, and not only is it dense with these glorious truths about God and important truths for us, but it's very relevant to our lives uh, today. Um, so uh, I thank God for the opportunity to, to teach through um, First Timothy. Now, our final message uh, covers verses 11 through 16 and 20 through uh, 21. And that brings up the question, what happened to verses 17 through 19? Well, we covered those last week, so I'll be skipping over them uh, this week since we already already covered them. So let's look at our text. I'll begin by reading it. But you, man of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only one who has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. No one has seen or can see him. To him be honor and eternal might. Amen. And then in verse 20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent, empty speech, and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears that name. By professing it, some people have deviated from the faith. Grace and peace, uh, grace be with you, with all of you. Grace be with all of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do need your grace. We need your help every day. And we need your help to flee from all types of temptation and evil. We need your, your help to fight for your truth for, and, and, and uh, the, the, the faith and to hold on to our faith in Jesus uh, because by your grace, through faith in Jesus, uh, we have the wonderful promise and hope of eternal life. Uh, so help us to do what Paul was uh, encouraging Timothy to do, and of course it applies to all of us also. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. So let's see. Okay, we just pray. So Paul begins by referring to, to Timothy as man of God. Uh, so in the Old Testament, a number of people like Moses and Elijah were called um, uh, man of God. And uh, it seems to be a term, and by the way, it, it, it could apply to um, uh, women. We could say a woman of God, or we could, we, we could say a person of God. Um, it seems to apply to people who are living for God, uh, seeking to do God's will, seeking to do his work, seeking to follow him. Um, in general, you know, a, a mature Christian who is following God could be called a, a, a person of God. This phrase is used one other time in the New Testament, also by Paul in his second letter to Timothy, where he says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
So a person of God is someone who, with God's help, uh, by the Holy Spirit, is trying to live according to the Bible, uh, according to Scripture. They're, they're submitting themselves to God's truth, allowing the Bible to rebuke us when we're wrong, to correct us when we need to get back on the right track, to train us how to live in righteousness. And uh, people like this are people of God. So, so Paul says, uh, you, you man of God, um, run from these things. Now, what does he mean by these things? Well, in the immediate context, and you can look in your Bible at the verses before this, uh, or you could go back and watch my last message from uh, 1 Timothy, the previous one in this series, and you will see that in the immediate context, this is talking about running from the love of money and running from greed. But more generally, it means to flee all types of temptation, sin, and evil. And we know that it can apply to all types of temptation, sin, and evil, because very similar things are, are said in a few other Bible verses. Let's, let's look at these, and um, I pray that God will use this to motivate you to avoid and, 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 and flee from temptation and evil. In 1 Thessalonians, is talking uh, specifically about uh, uh, um, sexual immorality. So two of the giant temptations people have are uh, 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 greed, or we could say mater materialism, and another big, huge one is sexual immorality. And it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. In other words, that you should become uh, more and more free from sin, that you should become more and more like Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, I lived in Indonesia for 14 years uh, uh, with my, my family, my, my wife, Hope, and our wonderful daughter, Joy. And um, uh, so I learned Indonesian. And very rarely do I do this, but, but I remember that I really like the way this is expressed in Indonesian. Uh, uh, and, and I'll explain why in just a second. So it says, Karna inilah kehendak Allah pengudusanmu, yaitu supaya kamu menjauhi persabulan. So where it says avoid in English, it says menjauhi in Indonesian. And the word jau by itself, just not menjauhi, but just jau means far away. So we could say Indonesia is jau from America because it's literally on the other side of the world. It's uh, depending on whether we're daylight savings time or not, uh, it can be exactly 12 hours difference. So you think you got jet lag if you go one or two time zones, try going 11 or 12 or 13 uh, time zones. <laughs> um, it's a long ways. Um, well, this says menjawi, which means to make it far from, to, to, to put a big distance, put a big distance between you and sexual immorality. And... Um, uh, so avoid is not wrong. It's a good translation in English. But uh, I, I think that the Manjawi captures the, the feeling of this a little bit better. Put a lot of distance, and, and it also fits with the Greek well, I think. Put a lot of distance between you and sin. Put a lot of distance between you and temptation. We also see this in 1 Corinthians 6. Run from sexual immorality. Um, Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. So each type of, 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 of sin has things that are especially bad about it. And one of the things especially bad about sexual immorality is that the way that our, our, our own bodies are involved in it. And Paul says, run away from it. So... Um, the Bible never encourages you to get as close as possible to temptation or to get as close as possible to, to sin, uh, just the opposite. It, it encourages us to keep a, a distance from it. Now, we live in a world full of temptations, and we can't always avoid temptation. With God's help, we never have to sin, although none of us are perfect. Um, none of us do that perfectly. So, but... But God always gives us a way to escape from temptation. Um, and sometimes temptation cannot be avoided. 
But there's lots of situations where we can avoid temptation and we should avoid temptation. In general, when we're able to avoid temptation, we should treat temptation like most of us would treat this. Um, now, there may be a few, some unusual person watching this video who likes snakes and walks with snakes or studies snakes, and uh, you're not re really scared of them. But most of you probably feel like me. If you saw this, you aren't going to think, hmm, I wonder how close I can get to it and still be okay. I wonder if it's okay, like if, if I was walking down the road, like I, I go on walks early in the morning with my dog, uh, Sadie, uh, very, very rarely, even though we live in the country and there are a lot of snakes ar around here, they're, they're usually hiding from us. They, they, d they don't want to see us. So very rarely have I seen one. Uh, I have, but, but rarely. Um, but I have no desire to, to, to see how close I can get to it. I don't want to see, is it okay if I, if I walk, you know, three feet from it? What if I walk one foot from it? Is it okay if I touch it just a little bit, you know, maybe in the middle, not too near the head? Have you ever thought that way about, you know, uh, a snake, especially if you thought it might be a poisonous one? But even the ones that aren't poisonous, I don't want them to bite me. I mean, have you ever thought that way? And yet, people often treat temptation like that. They're like, um, uh, you know, um, like maybe, maybe a, a, a lot of guys struggle with lustful thoughts. And, 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 and they know that they shouldn't watch pornography, but maybe they think, you know, it's probably okay for me to watch that R-rated movie with the sexy scene where the uh, good-looking actress is, is, is shown naked or almost naked, or, and, uh, and, and, you know, see how close you can get to it without sinning? Well, it <laughs> that's a bad strategy. That's, you know, that's like, that's like saying, I wonder if it's okay for me to walk six in inches from the poisonous snake. Run from it. Run from sexual immorality. That's the wisdom from the Bible, and that is what Paul is encouraging Timothy to do. And uh, Well, in this case, the Corinthians. Uh, but he encourages Timothy in general to flee from sin. Uh, back here in 1 Timothy 6.11. Um, and then the Bible also says, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Now, probably most of you watching this, maybe all of you watching this, I don't know for sure, uh, don't feel like idolatry is a temptation for you. And it might not be. You know, like worshiping a, an idol of some type or, or worshiping a false god or praying to an idol or to a false god or to anyone other than the true god. Um, you might feel like, well, that's just not, you know, I have no desire to do that. And that's great. Not everyone is tempted by every sin. But you probably know people who are. And you might think, no, I, I, I don't know anyone who does that. I, oh, yeah, I bet you do. Because this is a very widespread problem among uh, uh, Roman Catholics. And, and, and you almost certainly know some people who are Roman Catholic. And among uh, Eastern Orthodox. A little less common that you would know people among Eastern Orthodox, but there's, uh, but you, you, there's a fair chance you do. I do. Um, and um, uh, they, unfortunately, have mixed in. They have a lot of truth. The Roman Catholics believe Jesus rose from the dead, that he died for our sins, that the Bible is true. Um, so, so there's a lot of good things they believe, but they also uh, pray to to Mary, and, and, and they're like kneel down before statues of, 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 of Mary like this uh, sometimes and, 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 and pray. And, um, and boy, the way that the things they say about her in their prayers and in little songs and stuff that they have uh, for both Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, it sure does sound like worship. Somebody who who th they will insist that they're not actually worshiping her, but it so does look like they are. And this is my advice to anyone in the Roman Catholic Church or in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, my advice is flee. Get out of it. Get, get away because there's idolatry mixed into their worship. Get out. Get into a healthy uh, church where there's not idolatry uh, mixed into their worship the way there is in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox 
churches. Um, flee from idolatry. Don't don't see how close you can get to it. Like, well, you know, maybe if I pray to Mary and I'm thinking this and I view it this way, it's not technically idolatry. I think it is, but even if you think it's technically not, it sure is awful darn close. Flee, flee from idolatry. Don't don't get close to it. It's dangerous. Um, like all sin is dangerous. So we are now, now, Paul says, but you, man of God, run from these things in pursue. We are called to run from sin, but there's another side of it. We are also called to wa- run tw- towards the things of God. We are supposed to uh, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So pursue these things, that means intentionally do them. Just don't just don't uh, wait and hope that you will just, you know, kind of um, somehow start to be more righteous, more godly, more faithful, more loving. Think about these things and intentionally be like this. Intentionally do and develop them in, in your life. And there's different ways to... You do that, Bible meditation and prayer and serving God and being active in Christian fellowship. And then just putting these things into practice. Think about them. If you read your Bible and you think about this verse, and then you're in a situation uh, where these things are called for, think about it and and intentionally act like this. Pursue these good things. Um, Jesus calls us to come just as we are. Messed up, sinful, gunked up, maybe full of some people, before they're saved, are full of anger and fear and maybe hate and uh, all kind of yucky stuff uh, gunking up. Uh, and Jesus says, come just as you are. He's, he, he, he doesn't want you to try to get cleaned up first. The whole point is you can't really successfully clean yourself up without, uh, without Jesus doing it and Jesus being involved. So he says, come, you're messed up, that's okay, God loves you. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Uh, you don't, <laughs> the whole, that's the whole reason you need to come to Jesus as your Lord and Savior is because you, 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 you need to be forgiven for your sins. Come just as you are. But the Bible never says to stay as you are. Uh, yeah, go and sin no more. So come to Jesus messed up. But then as you walk with Jesus, pursue these good things. Uh, flee from the bad things and pursue these good things so that you become more like Jesus as you follow him. And then it says, fight the good fight for the faith. Now, one way to interpret this is to flee from evil, to resist temptation and evil, and to fight to be good. So you could say that's just another way of saying what he said in verse 11. Um, But I think it... I think it has some other applications, and probably the main, in, in this case, when, when Paul says this, application has to do with fighting for the truth. So yes, this can be applied in many ways. This, you can just take that line, fight the good fight for the faith, or, or, or you could say the, the good fight of the faith, and apply it like, to the whole Christian life, basically. But it likely includes specifically fighting spiritually. Uh, in other words, we're not fighting... When I say spiritually, I mean kind of like metaphorically. We're not, you know, using physical weapons like knives or swords or machine guns. Um, The weapons of our warfare are spiritually powerful. Uh, It includes fighting spiritually to defend and spread God's truth. When it says the the faith here, I think it's referring to um, the, 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 the truth that has been delivered to us. God revealed it to us. Uh, and, and, and now we have it in the Bible. It came through his apostles, and now we have it in the Bible. And, and unfortunately, this truth is constantly under attack from people, both people outside the Christian faith and from false teachers within the Christian faith. And so we need to defend the truth, and we need to um, uh, work to spread the, tr- the truth and... Uh, and, and, and to help other people to be to not fall into lies and deceptions, but to understand and believe the truth. 
And this does involve uh, debates, arguments, uh, conflicts with people with different views. Um, now, we want to do that gently, and we want to do it in a Christ-like way, but uh, it, it, it is um, it's difficult. Uh, uh, John Stott, uh, he has a great book on First Timothy and, 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 and Titus, a great commentary called, uh, it's, it's, it's rel relatively small, called The Message of First Timothy and Titus. I highly recommend it. It has often helped me as I've been going through this series. And uh, this is what he wrote. He wrote, fighting is an unpleasant business, undignified, bloody, painful, and dangerous. So is controversy. That is fighting for truth and goodness. There is something sick about those who relish it. Like if somebody's like, oh, great, I get to, uh, you know, uh, argue with somebody who has wrong views. <laughs> it's not healthy if, 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 if that just feels fun to you. But it but it is good to do if you do it the right way. He says, nevertheless, it is a good fight. It has to be fought. Um, so we don't fight because we enjoy fighting. We fight because what we're fighting for is so valuable. Uh, uh, soldiers uh, understand this. Uh, general Douglas MacArthur, a, a famous general from World War II, an American general, said, the soldier above all other people prays for peace. For he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. So he certainly understood that war was necessary sometimes and that it was right to fight, uh, to defend good things. But it wasn't, it's not something that anybody enjoys or should enjoy. The same ideal is brought forth in a fictional book by uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, The Lord of the Rings, which I think is the greatest work of fiction from the 20th century. Uh, it's okay if you disagree. That's not like a, a part of the Christian faith. But um, uh, And one of his characters, he, he, who's a very kind of heroic, uh, noble character, says this. He, 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 he's a great warrior, but he says this. I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for its glory. I love only that which they defend. That's from the two towers, because the Lord of the Rings is a trilogy, so this is book number two, uh, spoken by his character, the noble uh, Faramir. Um, and uh, I think that captures well. Uh, it's not that we love arguing or debating, but we love the truth that we're defending, and we love the people whose lives are impacted by the truth and whose lives could be ruined by false teaching if we don't defend it. So that's why we are, are, are willing be involved in that type of activity. When we fight the good fight for the faith, which is an unpleasant duty, often it's unpleasant. I'm not saying it's always miserable to be involved in that type of thing, but there is, there is an unpleasantness to it, and I've been involved in a fair bit of it, and, and I feel that unpleasantness. Um, we are defending the very truth of God, much is at stake. So, so yes, uh, until Jesus comes back and, and, and all deception is ended and all deceivers are destroyed, um, until then, we have to fight for the truth. Um, and as I said, uh, the warfare imagery can be applied very broadly to our entire Christian life until Jesus returns. In a way, all of Christian life and all ministry involves an element of spiritual warfare. Um, that doesn't mean that the Christian life is only spiritual warfare. That's definitely not true. It has to do with love and family. Uh, uh, the, the, the most common term for Christians in the New Testament is uh, brothers and sisters. It has to do with love and family and serving God. But because there's evil in this world, the, the world of the, our own flesh and the devil is opposed to us, until Jesus comes back, spiritual warfare is a part of everything we do. Now, uh, Paul goes on to say, take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, that, the, the, the Greek word for take hold is a strong word that can mean something like seize or grab it and hold, hold it tightly. 
depending on the context where that word is used. And in this context, I do think that's what it means. I think it means grab it and hold it tightly. Um, it, it, it did, another place where this word was used is in the story where um, Jesus is walking on the water and he invites Peter to come out and walk on the water. And um, Peter begins to, but then he looks at the waves and he gets scared and he starts to sink. Um, and then it says this, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold, it's the same word in Greek, took hold of him saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So, 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 so Jesus, I love that image. He, he, he grabs and he holds tightly onto Peter. So Peter's not going to sink. Peter's not going to drown. He was beginning to sink, but now he's okay because Jesus has got him. Jesus isn't going to let him go. And uh, boy, what a beautiful image of how Jesus saves all of us when we call out to him because Peter called out to, to Jesus uh, because he knew that Jesus was the only one who could save him from drowning. And we know that Jesus is, is the only one that can save us from our sins. So Paul wants Timothy and us to grab hold of and hold on to our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and to keep believing and living in light, light of the belief that through faith in Jesus, we are given eternal life. That, that's what I think that Paul means here. Um, now, in some ways, we already have eternal life. And in other ways, eternal life begins when we are resurrected. So let me show you this. Um, in John 5, 24, Jesus says, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So there's a sense in which I have eternal life right now because I believe in Jesus. And if you believe in Jesus, so do you. And if you don't believe in Jesus, I hope and pray that you will so that you will have eternal life. Um, and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. But then in, in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writes, in, in verse 7, he writes, He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, in other words, we've been forgiven, and because we've been forgiven and because of our relationship with Jesus, we are treated uh, as if we have no sin in, in God's eyes. Uh, some people use a little saying to, to, to remember what justified means. Uh, it means just as if I never sinned. Uh, and that actually is a good way to remember it. Um, having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. The hope. Now, that implies that we don't have it yet. It's something that we're looking forward to. And in a way, that's true also. Because unless Jesus comes back first, I'm going to die. So, so, so um, but then I'll be resurrected. And, and then, from that time on, I will never die again. Uh, now, how do these two things go together? Already having it and it being a hope. We can see that if we go back to Titus chapter 1. Paul, a slave of God and, a, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life. There it is, the hope of eternal life again, that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So in a way, eternal life is in the future, but God has promised it to us, so it's certain. So, okay, this is a hypothetical um, analogy. Uh, I'm not really doing this, but hypothetically, if I said, if anyone uh, mentions me by name in the comments to this video, I will send you $100. Okay, if you believed me, you could, you could put type a comment in the video, and then you might tell a friend or a family member, you might say, I just got $100, or I have a, I have a, a $100 I can do something with, even though you don't actually do it yet. But you, if you believe me, you believe you're going to get it. Now, the problem is, even if 
I'm not making that promise. So if you put a, a, a note in, the, in this YouTube video, <laughs> you're not actually getting $100 from me, okay? It's just hypothetical. But <laughs> just to make that clear, um, okay, but even if, I, even if I seriously said that, it wouldn't actually be guaranteed. I, 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 I might fail to send you $100. I might die before I get a chance to send you $100. But if God promises you something, it is 100% guaranteed, absolutely certain that it's going to happen. And so when Jesus says you have eternal life, what he's meaning is you can count on it. It's a done deal. You are definitely going to be resurrected and then never die again if you believe in Jesus. Because this isn't a promise from Mark Corbett. This is a promise from the King of Kings, the Lord of the universe, the creator of everything. He, he, he cannot lie. God cannot lie, and he never fails. Uh, and so you can count on having eternal life if you believe in Jesus, even though in a way it doesn't really begin until you are resurrected. And we'll see that more in a minute. That, 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 that's how the Bible thinks of it. So he says, take hold of eternal life. Now, we will understand what Paul means by this most fully and most clearly if we clear up some very common misconceptions among Christians about eternal life and immortality. He also mentions immortality in just a minute in uh, verse 16. He says he's talking about God, and he says the only one who has immortality. And a lot of Christians... I would say most Christians, in my experience, have some misunderstandings about eternal life and immortality. So I want to take this opportunity to hopefully help clear that up a little bit. I hope and pray God will use it in that way. So what does it mean when it says that God is the only one who has immortality? We, we just said that he has promised that those who believe in Jesus will have eternal life. And eternal life and immortality are basically the same thing. Uh, I'll even show you a verse that, that demonstrates that in a minute. But it just makes sense. Immortality means that you live forever, and eternal life means that you live forever. So it's two different words for the same thing. So why does it say that God is the only one who has immortality? Well, Paul probably means that only God, by his very own nature, is immortal. It is part of who God is and always has been and always will be. And that makes it, it, him different from me and you. Um, so, uh, so this is part of God's very nature. Jesus said in John chapter 5, For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. So God doesn't need someone else to make him be alive or to keep him alive. Because of who he is, we, we, our ability to understand God is limited. But we can believe what he's revealed about himself. And one of the things he's revealed about himself is it's just part of God. It's part of being God is that he's alive. He always has been alive and always will be alive. Um, but that's different from us. Let's look at verse 13 in 1 Timothy. So here we have verse 12 and then uh, uh, 16, but let's put verse 13 in here. In the presence of God who gives life to all. So nobody gave life to God. He's always had it and always will have it. But all the rest of us get to be alive because God gives us life. Life is a gift to each person, each moment. And eternal life is that gift, that gift of life, made permanent for those who have faith in Christ at the resurrection. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15 where you'll see this a little bit more clearly, I hope. Here we go. I love this passage. Uh, it's so encouraging and beautiful. Um, I share parts of this at just about every funeral I've ever preached, and I've, I've preached uh, a lot of funerals. Um, so, Paul says, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. Okay, by mystery, he doesn't mean like a story where you have to figure out who did it. <laughs> and he doesn't mean something spooky or weird. Uh, that's often how we use the word mystery. But when the New Testament uses the word mystery, what it means is part of 
part of God's truth that we would never have figured out on our own. The only way that we know it is that God revealed it to us. And generally, he does this by revealing it to his prophets and apostles, and now it's in the Bible. Um, so, so we do know. It's not something that we don't know. We know the mystery, but we know it only because God revealed it to us. You can't walk down the street and figure this out by yourself. Um, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. Those are people who are still alive when Jesus comes back. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. So, if God hadn't told us this, we wouldn't know it. Uh, you know, I, I've never seen someone raised from the dead, and then they were incorruptible. So how would I know that, except that God, who does know it, has revealed it, and I believe him. For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptible, incorruptibility, in this, this mortal, me and you and everybody who believes in Jesus, this mortal must be clothed with immortality. So right now, I can die. And, and, and unless Jesus comes back first, I will die sometime. And so will you. Um, but to, when, when, when I'm resurrected, God wants me to live with him forever. And so he's going to change me. We will be changed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be immortal, and I will never die again, and you will never die again. Uh, but I'm not that way now. Is this making sense? This mortal must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal is clothed with immortality. Okay, the incorruptibility means not only will I not die, but I won't wear down. Like, like I'm 59 now. My body is in a lot worse condition than it was when I was 19 or 29. When I was 19 I, I, uh, or 18, 17, I was running marathons uh, before I was 19. And I was in really good shape back then. Um, whew, now uh, I can get winded walking up a hill. I, I, I have asthma. And all of us, our bodies wear down in different ways uh, as we get older. You, if you're past 40, you have begun to feel this reality. You feel it a little bit before then, but... Uh, and then, uh, anyways, but we won't be, we'll be incorruptible. We'll be healthy and strong forever. <laughs> we'll never get arthritis. We'll never get asthma. We'll never get acid reflux. We'll never get cancer. We'll never, nothing bad will ever happen to us physically. Uh, and we'll be immortal. Then the saying that it's written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, who is the we that is, he says, we will be changed. Who is this? Will all humans be raised immortal to live forever and never die again? Let's look at the next verses and see. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The us in the we are those to whom God gives victory, those who have acknowledged Jesus as Lord. So not everybody is going to be, everybody's going to be resurrected, but those who, who don't know Jesus as Lord, they're not going to be changed like that. They're not going to be resurrected, immortal, because the wages of sin is death. They're going to die again in the final judgment. Um, now, we also see something relevant to this here in Romans chapter 2. But because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, these are people who are not saved. Uh, hopefully, they'll become saved. Uh, but because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. So this, uh, when God's righteous judgment is revealed, often the Bible calls this the day of judgment. So something is going to happen on the day of judgment. He will repay each one according to his work. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth but are dis uh, obeying unrighteousness. Now look, here's one verse that uses eternal life and immortality in the same verse, and it's pretty... I think most people can see this. 
to me, is pretty clear that these are just two different words for the same thing. And besides that, that's eternal life means living forever, and immortality means you never die, which means uh, living forever. So yes, in the Bible, eternal life and immortality are basically, basically the same thing. Um, but do, do people already have immortality before they are saved? No. It's something we need to seek. You don't seek something if you already have it. You seek something that you don't have but that you want. Um, and, and, and we should. We should be wanting immortality. Now, there's a right and a wrong way to, to, to seek it. And the, right, the wrong way to seek it is to trust in your own goodness because you're never going to be good enough based on, your, on how you live in this life. The right way to seek it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting him and having our sins forgiven and then trusting that he'll begin to transform us in this life. But then when we're resurrected, not only will we be immortal and incorruptible, but we will no longer have desires to sin. We will be holy. We will be sinless. We will be made fit for eternal life with Jesus. But, but that's something we, we have to seek. So a few points. Only God is now immortal by his very nature. So many Christians think that all people are mortal. That's, that's just not true. The Bible never says that all people have eternal life. There's lots of verses that talk about people having eternal life. All of those verses are talking about people who trust in God, who trust in Jesus. Uh, the Bible never says that all people have eternal life or that all people will be made immortal or that we already are mortal. Lots of people just think, oh, you know, everyone has an, an, an immortal soul. Show me the Bible verse that specifically says that, and it's not just talking about Christians. There is none. There's no Bible verse that says that. Uh, eternal life and immortality are conditional. The condition is having faith in Jesus, and then we're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus. Uh that's the condition. Belie what is the condition? Believing in Jesus, confessing Jesus as Lord, like it says in Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this raises the question, well, what happens to those who are not given the gift of eternal life and who are not made immortal so that they have victory over death? Okay. Well, they don't live forever. That's obvious. I hope that's obvious. If you don't have eternal life, that definitely means that you're not going to live forever. Um, now, does the Bible tell us specifically what happens to them? Yes, it does, over and over again. The Bible says they perish. That's in John 3.16. God destroys their bodies and souls in hell. That's in Matthew 10.28. They don't live forever in hell. We already established that they are not immortal. They haven't been given eternal life. Some people think the difference between the saved and the unsaved is that the saved will live in one place forever, uh, the good place, up, up, up there, the good place, while the unsaved live down there in the bad place forever. But that's, the Bible never puts it that way. The Bible says the difference is that the saved will have eternal life and the unsaved will perish. Just think about John 3.16, um, Matthew 10.28. Uh, and then the unsaved, they will be burned up and torn to ashes. Uh, you can see that in 2 Peter 2.6. And there's many other Bible verses that teach this. This doctrine is called conditional immortality. Um, it doesn't mean that, that once you're immortal, you might lose your immortality. That's not what it means. It means that you, you will be made immortal only on the condition that you have faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the part about perishing in hell, and obviously, if you're not immortal, you're going to perish. The, the, the part about perishing in hell is often called annihilationism. And, and that part is controversial. But I think it's very clearly taught in the Bible. To learn more about this, go to rethinkinghell.com. There's a big ministry. I didn't start it, but I, I participate in it. Uh, I, I help with it. Or look at my own collection of videos and blog posts on this topic. 
if you search either Google or YouTube, uh, Mark Corbett Hell or Mark Corbett Annihilationism, uh, you'll, you'll find some of my material, and once you find some of it, you can find more of it. I have a whole um, group of videos. They're grouped together. Uh, I don't know if you call it a channel or... Uh, anyway, to have a group of videos specifically on uh, this this topic that I think could help you I if you want to learn more about this. Okay. Now that we understand what is at stake, eternal life, and this is a big deal. Don't you want to live forever with Jesus? Because it's going to be a perfect world. It's not going to be full of difficulty and pain like this life. Don't you want to live forever? Don't you want your loved ones to live forever? That's incredibly valuable. It's worth it, 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 it's worth giving your whole life to Jesus to get that. Jesus, <laughs> it, it, it's worth giving everything we have uh, to follow Jesus and to trust him. Trusting him off involves giving him our lives and um, uh, in, in order to gain eternal life. And we want other people to have it. Um, so now we understand what is at stake, eternal life. Um, let's go back to First Timothy. So he says, take hold of the eternal life uh, that you were called. Okay, God, uh, uh, by his providence, we hear the good news. We hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit's working in our hearts. We're called to, so God takes the initiative. We're called to follow Jesus. And then, uh, hopefully, we're called to that and have made a good confession. Um, I, I believe this is talking about uh, whenever Timothy first believed in Jesus, and he confesses Jesus as Lord, like, like, like Paul talks about in Romans 10. Um, he does this in the presence of many witnesses. Now, the Bible doesn't say that you have to do it in front of many witnesses, but I think it's very important to tell people when you get saved. Uh, and there are examples in the Bible, like Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was the only one there, other than the person who was getting saved. Um, Paul and the uh, Ephesian jailer, there was just a handful of people. So it doesn't have to be a big crowd. It doesn't have to be in front of a, 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 a church, although that's a, a good way to do it. But I do think it's very valuable and, and good for your faith to tell somebody when you decide that you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you want to follow him, tell somebody. Um, and then it says, in the presence of God who gives life to all, we already talked about that. And of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate. Now, Jesus made basically the same confession, not using the exact same words. Jesus confesses that, yes, he's a king. And, um, but his kingdom is not of this world. And uh, the implication is that he's the king from heaven. He's the king of everything. He's the king of the universe. Um, so we confess Jesus as Lord. And, and Jesus made that same type of confession before Pontius Pilate. Um, and and uh, so, so now looking at just 13, he says, in the presence of God. Remember, God is always with us. He's always seeing what we do, good and bad. And Paul's reminding Timothy and reminding us of this. He says, in the presence of God, he says, I charge you to keep the command. What, what command does he mean? Well, he just gave... Timothy several commands, and, and, and they apply to us too. So I think it would apply to all of these, the command to flee from evil. Remember that? Remember the picture of the snake? Get away from evil. Um, the command to pursue righteousness. Um, God isn't just calling us to not be bad. He's calling us positively to be like Jesus, to be good and loving and faithful and true and honorable, to be like Jesus, pursue righteousness, and the command to grab onto and not let go of faith in Jesus and believe in God's promise of eternal life and keep believing in it. Um, and, 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 and he says, do this without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't fail. Don't, don't stop believing in Jesus. Um, uh, and, 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 and don't stop following Jesus. And it says, now, now it says without fault. That's always the goal. Our goal is to not sin. Our goal is to not stumble. In this life, we're not going to be perfect. Remember there's grace. And that's just not me saying that. In just a minute, we're going to see that Paul uh, closes this letter by
by um, a blessing of grace being uh, to all of us. Uh, so we need grace even after we're saved, and praise God, there's lots of grace. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we look forward to. This is our hope. Um, now, when will it happen? When, when, when will Jesus appear? Well, we just keep on reading. We go to the next verse. God will bring this about in his own time. Some foolish people have thought that they knew when Jesus was coming back <laughs> that they've been proved wrong over and over again. Now, because people are constantly predicting it, sooner or later, by luck, somebody might get it right. But, but God is in control of this, and, and, and he hasn't revealed to us the, 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 the day or the year. Um, he is being patient. Uh, why hasn't he come back so far? He is being patient so that more people can be saved. God knows what he is doing. Peter talks about this. We're going to look at this. I'm not going to comment on it very much. I'm mostly just going to read it. Peter wrote, first be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. Uh, escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will born and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. He's, he's thinking the same way Paul does, which isn't surprising. They're both being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, in holy conduct and godliness, as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. Okay, back to First Timothy chapter 6. Uh, he, God, is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, he's the one that's in charge. He's the one that, that, that saves us. He's the one that's going to uh, uh, send Jesus back and fix the world and get rid of evil. Uh, he's the one we should trust. He's the one we should worship. He's the one we should obey. Uh, he's the only one who has immortality. We already looked at that uh, part of verse 16. Dwelling in unapproachable light, no one has seen or can see him. We can't see him directly now. Um, in the Bible, a few people got glimpses of his glory, but they didn't see him fully or directly. But one day we will, because we, part of being changed and being made immortal and incorruptible, also we will be totally sanctified and made holy, and then we will be able to see him face to face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To him be honor and eternal might. Amen. When Paul thinks about who God is, it leads him to worship God, and it should lead us to worship God. If theological truth doesn't lead you to worship, you, it has, you haven't gotten it. It, it hasn't do, done its job yet in, its, in your mind and in, in your heart. Uh, and then down in verse 20, the last two verses of First Timothy. Timothy, God, what has been entrusted to you, the truth about God, the good news, the gospel that has come through Paul and the other apostles, now we have it in the Bible. God, what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent, empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears that name. By professing it, some people have deviated from the faith. So they get these wrong ideals. They think they're smart. They think they have knowledge that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. It causes them to leave the, to, to deviate from the faith. Whew, don't do that. But then, but then Paul speaks not just to Timothy, but to, but to, but to all, all of us. Grace be with all of you. Of course, really, his words to Timothy have applied to, to us in many ways all along. Grace, grace be with all of you. So, so, so Paul gives a final warning against false teaching. 
I'm not going to emphasize this because I've covered it repeatedly as we've gone through First Timothy. It's been a major theme of First Timothy. It's a major theme all throughout the Bible. And then he closes with something that we all need, grace. We all need grace. We, we still sin. We, we should avoid it, but we don't always do that, do we? Uh, we all fall short. We all need grace every day, and God has grace for us. Grace be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the good news. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Help us to avoid sin and to avoid temptation. Help us to pursue righteousness and love and goodness and faithfulness and to become more like Jesus. Help us to believe in you and your good news and hold on to your truth and your promises of eternal life in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And I pray that you will give abundant grace to all who are listening to this or watching it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.